Welcome to Rewilding Love. This season is with a couple on the brink of divorce. This is episode number three, Finding Common Ground and Rewilding Love. I may have just made the biggest mistake of my life. I didn't get married to like have uncertainties. I always felt like we were really passionate and affectionate and loved each other beyond belief. I mean, yeah. we said I love you literally our first date. I love the girl. I know that there's episodes and moments that I'm not in love with. The innate harmony, love, well-being is actually already there. Hunky Dory, I, I can't believe I just said that. I think it was that. We're engaged. Like I'm going to get the girl that I want all the time. In any given moment, his vibe just changes. And it's like, boom, Like you hate me all of a sudden. I want to be all in. I want nothing more than to have this affectionate, romantic relationship. He's decided that he's got the moral high ground. And she's absolutely batshit crazy. I'm tired of being the only responsible one. I almost feel like I'm the man. I don't understand where right. things went wrong. Well, I think I'm in, I'm in the mood for a, another metaphor. Okay. <laughs> Is it a boxing metaphor? Oh, dude, the look, like the energy I see behind her eyes, like I know that she has these moments where she's the greatest person in the world. If you're going to keep using boxing analogies, I might have to start understanding boxing. But I didn't get married to get divorced. I can tolerate all the different types of abuse that I've, you know, been through. I think that he is suffering from some sort of depression. She's ultimately sensing that there's more going on than meets the eye. Is the juice worth the squeeze, you know? There's a lot of squeezing. I'm not getting much juice out of it. You are listening to Untamed with me, Angus Ross. And me, Rohini Ross. Untamed is a podcast about relationships. We believe that love never disappears completely in relationships. It can always be rewilded. Listen in as we coach a real couple back to their natural state of love. Relax and enjoy the show. The journey with Alicia Mateo continues. It does. And when we left off with them last time, it was pretty clear that they each have their own version of reality that feels absolutely true to them, and they feel very justified in their position. And one of their positions they feel justified in is that they see the other person as responsible for their suffering. There isn't a lot of understanding of each other and each other's experience because they're so polarized. And rather than being able to get settled and have some perspective on their relationship and on each other, they're more caught up in listening to their own inner narrative that's based on their own fears and concerns and responding accordingly. And because of that, the rapport and the relationship is going downhill because their behavior, both of their behavior can be very hurtful at times. Yeah, I mean, I, I have the impression of two prize fighters going back to their prospective corners and feeling like they've made all the shots that they want to and they've probably got a few points up on the board. And, um, and really, they'll just see where this goes. But it's in a sense, it's kind of like we're at this point, it feels like we're at the end of round one we don't really know where this is going to go. We'll see. It's true. We're stepping into the unknown, and I really acknowledge them for their courage and being willing to step into the unknown with us. Yeah, no, they are. I mean, they're extremely courageous in a sense, it's just by virtue of the fact they've even agreed to do this. Absolutely. Yeah. And so even though all of that is going on, part of our responsibility and our job is to really look for where the seeds of love are in the relationship so that we can really bring focus to that and support the rewilding of love in their relationship with each other. Yeah, that's 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 the part that I really enjoy. It's kind of being like, I don't know, what are we? A sort of, are we an ecologist trying to pull out some seeds of love or or are we a detective trying to find out where it is? Yeah, we have to have a good eye for it because sometimes it's hard to see. <laughs> sometimes it's very hard to see, certainly in all that, uh, you know, with all that 
negative sentiment that we've witnessed thus far. But I have to say this one um, segment that we're going to play next, Angus, I think you did an amazing job of really uh, helping to point Mateo in the direction of seeing the love and really, um, you know, doing your best to try and have him focus on the love versus all of the things that are um, wrong in his eyes with the relationship. And I would definitely say, given how he entered the intensive, you had a, a harder job of that than I did because Alicia was uh, committed to the marriage. She didn't want it to end, but I would say you had your work cut out for you with Mateo in terms of helping him see the seeds of love, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would say if we're going to, or if I'm going to continue with the boxing analogy. <laughs> oh, no, you're not, are you? <laughs> he had his guard up. He had a very good plan, and he was going to stick to it. If you're going to keep using boxing analogies, I might have to start understanding boxing, and that's well, going to be a who problem. Who knows? Maybe this will be an education for you. Okay. All right. Well, let, let's hear that segment with you and Mateo now. Just can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, because I'm, well, that's what I'm really curious about, because um, given all that you said, that's a, that's a, that looks like a pretty hard life. Um, so I'm I'm now curious about what it is that that, that you you know that, that you feel connected and bonded, in a sense of, and I know that you 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 have this intention and you want this to work out. But what is it that you see that that you love that you that, that kind of brings you joy and delight? She has this energy behind her eyes and her smile that's literally, like, like a kid in. There is, um, it seems like there's no damage behind that. And uh, you just get that in glimpses. It's okay. So the, the emotion that's coming up for me just from where I'm sitting just suggests that there is, there is, a, there is quite a deep love. There definitely is, but um, the glimpses are not getting us through, you know? And uh, the glimpses, like, that, uh, that energy that I see um, behind her eyes is, is becoming, like, numb to me. And, uh, yeah, I mean... It just feels like I'm... It just feels like it doesn't exist anymore. And and uh, the glimpses that I, I do see, I, I just catch myself thinking, like, it's total bullshit. Like, in an hour, you're going to be bitching about something or God knows what. But, like, like I'm so jaded that I, I feel like I'm jaded in my life. And I see, like, the, this innocence and... Uh, it's just not, it's well, not carrying me through anymore yeah. because uh, I know what's going to transpire and, you know, in a couple minutes, an hour, a day, like just, I just, I just know it's like, it's like looking at a beautiful scenery and just, and wanting to live there and, and like set, you know, your build a home on a foundation, but you know that, you know, somehow you know that there's a missile going to propel itself into the hillside and it's going to be gone. Right, so you're just like, what's the point of even enjoying it? Well, let me let me um, let me go somewhere with this because, you know, when we started and I said, you know, this is good news because it feels very workable. In a sense, the emotion that just came up, that's really that's real and that's palpable. That's there's almost there's a spiritual quality to that. There's something very deep and meaningful in that emotion, and that. What I'm going to be pointing to, that's kind of your essential nature. That's our essential nature as human beings, is that, is that, 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 uh, that, that desire and need to be connected at that level. We kind of all want to operate at that level, that magic sweet spot where we feel love, particularly in a relationship. And in a sense, what I'm going to be pointing to, and what I was alluding to the fact that this is good news, is that you may think that those are just sort of few and far between, and maybe they are, but that's kind of like your innate 
essential nature, that, that, that part of you that feels that love. The rest of it, and this is the good news, and this may not seem even feasible at this point in time, but the rest of it is just stuff that we make up. That's kind of the bullshit that we make up. All those narratives that we build up over the course of time. That's that's what we're gonna you know that's what we're gonna really point to this weekend is just is just turning that on its head. Well, I think I'm in I'm in the mood for a, another metaphor. Okay, <laughs> is it a boxing metaphor? No, it's not. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm gonna be accused of mixing my metaphors. I don't know. Um, well, you know, I don't. Well, you probably don't know. I think the only reason I know is that my brother brother. Uh, went and did this a long time ago, I hasten to add. I don't know if he'd be still of a mindset to do something so brutal. But years ago, he went on vacation in Scotland and went deer hunting. Oh, really? And um, part of that experience is that you get assigned what I think is referred to as a stalker. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not in the modern Hollywood sense of the word, but in the traditional sense of the word. And that stalker basically helps the uh, the person with the gun to go and find the deer. <laughs> but they're, they're like a tracker. Um, I guess you could say that they have some tracking skills. Okay. I don't know where stalking or that verb, but we don't even know really what it means. I don't know. Well, well, just so I understand, the person that goes with your brother is there to help him find the deer? Yes. Okay. They have skills and they know where the deer are. Okay. And they know the telltale signs Got it. and where to look. And so, in a sense, that's my role with Matteo. I am that stalker, but I am a stalker for love. <laughs> <laughs> and my sole objective is to get that in his sight or his sights his, his uh, gun sights, as it were, and, uh, and help him look in that direction. And, I, and, I, and it was very cool in that experience to just suddenly realize that, ah, he saw it because the emotion really conveyed that he's something really registered at a very deep level. So that was kind of exciting. Yeah, it was really powerful to hear the depth of his feeling and how much he cares about Alicia. Like, that's just really obvious when he allows himself to drop in, that's what comes up. But then he pops up very quickly back into his um, story about how bad it is with her, what's wrong, and he just goes there very quickly. But he did settle that little bit, and it was really right there, just how much he cares and how much he's hurting and how much he misses her and how much he misses uh, the relationship the way he knows it can be. And um, to go along with your stalking metaphor, that you have to be really persistent with him. And, and you know, we'll, we'll share the next clip, but even though he was able to touch into the feeling and connect with the love in a way, he popped back out. And so you had to be persistent and kind of help pointing him in the direction of love. Yeah, no, I thank you. I thank you for noticing that. I think, I think that those are the moments where I just feel like this, this canned applause is sounding off in my head. And yeah, I did feel that there was that moment where he was starting to drift away. He was losing, he was losing, you know, his attention was going elsewhere. He's been stuck, sucked over back to the dark side. <laughs> but I had to, you know, try and pull him back. And we have to remember that oftentimes... It feels very vulnerable for people to be in their emotional experience. Many people aren't used to, especially men, I'm going to stereotype here, but oftentimes men are not comfortable in the more vulnerable feeling states. They're sort of societally conditioned not to go there. And so it can, you know, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that he's not able to stay there very long. Yeah, I know. Actually, in a sense, I was really shocked at that sudden level of vulnerability so the fact that we went there for any length of time for me was was quite a win yeah in the grand scheme of things yeah and so here we'll listen into the next part where you're sort of remembering to uh you're assisting him and to remember to come back and look in the direction of love to to see what 
his uh, wisdom is actually pointing him towards. And, and that's really what you're going to be doing a lot this intensive. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll be, th- be there on my shooting stick, <laughs> waiting for the action to unfold. I hope you come up with a less violent metaphor <laughs> soon. <laughs> What's keeping you in this relationship? Is it you on some level? There's some wisdom within you that's seeing her innate mental health. It's seeing you know, the love that's behind her eyes or whatever, however you're articulating. On some level, you're seeing her essential nature. Yeah. But if you're, if you're going to sit there and say, you know, she, you're kind of defining her along you know, how she showed up in your relationship, that's not seeing that. There's something that's holding you in place, something that's keeping you in this relationship based on what you're seeing. Yeah. And that's what you kind of got to open up to. Yeah. I'm here because of, because of her and wanting to have those glimpses of like, Oh my God, like we are the greatest couple on this earth. Like, well, do you, do there's you, you no feel one. that? I feel have, have you've had it feel experiences of that. I haven't felt that in a long time. Right. I have felt more lately. Like, God, we could be so great and we don't have to fake it like we're faking it. Right. That's what I'm feeling now. Before it was like, oh my God, you and I, like we could conquer anything. Like this is so great. Now it's like, oh my God, like we could, but even the glimpses that we have now are are so fake. Like we're so fake. It hasn't been anything real in a long time. And that's where I'm kind of having these thoughts of like, how much longer are you going to have to fake it for? You have to fake it forever. You know, if it gets better, like how much better is it going to get? And it's not changing. And it's not changing because there's not a baby here. It's not changing because any of that stuff. It's just not changing because of who she is and possibly how she was brought up. Um, what yeah, she but it's witnessed kind of, as a child I don't know when you say things like it's who she is it's kind of like that's almost like the same as the therapist saying that this client of mine is broken it's kind of like you're not seeing her innate mental health but what's at odds with that is the level of sentiment that came up when you when I asked you you know to, to sort of highlight some of the things that are positive about the relationship there was a real there was something that was very heartfelt that came very present and was very very obvious to me so it's kind of, that's what I'm so curious about, is, is, that, is that that's kind of what's, key. it seems like I would have to believe that that's what's keeping you in it. Well, I mean, I guess you could do the same thing as like, hey, if, you're, if your mom was so verbally abusive to you and your sister, like, why'd you stay? It's like, well, it's my mom, right? Well, here it is, is why are you staying? And it's like, dude, the look, like the energy I see behind her eyes, like I know that she has these moments where she's the greatest person in the world. That's what keeps me in it. It's right. the same thing. Right. I can with, I can tolerate all the different types of abuse that I've, you know, been through, um, been subjected to, whatever, however you want to say it. Um, I can withstand all those things, but the, you know, I'm a man now. And I get to choose what, yeah. how I interact with people, how people, I let people interact with me. So that's what is causing me to move away from, oh, you know, we're married. Is it going to be a forever thing? To maybe this isn't going to be a forever thing, right. right? But what's keeping me in is, is that like, oh my God, like this, this girl is great. Like, look at her eyes. Look at this, her genuine smile when it does occur. It's phenomenal. It brightens up a room, but at the same time, it's, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? You know, there's a lot of squeezing. I'm not getting much fucking juice out of this shit. <laughs> he, he certainly has a way with words. I'll give him that. He's got his own metaphors going. <laughs> I mean, it's quite an interesting dance in the sense that I'm trying to keep him on point in terms of looking at the direction of the love and really for him to get there he has to find that vulnerability within himself and so you know it may be my fault maybe that for him it's very uncomfortable to get to that level of vulnerability but you can see how he's just sort of getting back into his defenses which obviously you know are intellectual in the way that 
he's seeing the relationship and and that level of feeling that was there and was so palpable as i said before or said in the in the in the in the um the sound bite um he has now gone back into his shell in a sense and now i've got to really find a way to get him back out <laughs> and i guess i i look back on that 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 specific exchange and realize that I could maybe have done a better job of, of not letting him get back there so quickly. Or, or for him, just seemingly, he feel like he really got back in his shell. And, uh, and, in it, in it, and ultimately was in a very humorous way. <laughs> and, and humor is one of his strengths. It is, But yeah. it is also one of his defenses, too. And I, I, don't, I don't think that you didn't handle that in the right way I think that you're you know we're really simply there holding space and the innate health the innate wisdom the innate love in the individual working with is going to come forward in its own timing we're not there to make it happen in any certain way yeah yeah no um, I guess I felt like I was just hanging on for dear life and he was falling back into the abyss yeah of his humor yes <laughs> which was quite funny it was so now we'll hear a little bit from alicia and as i said before my work was a little easier in the sense that alicia was fully committed to the relationship and really wanted to be in the marriage and so we'll just hear a little bit from her about that my vows, I broke my vows, and I literally said in, um, um, that I wish that you can see me through, your, through my eyes mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. that you can see how special you are. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I truly feel and believe, and like, that'll trigger me because yeah. I'm like, he's so amazing. Yes. And yeah. I hate when he gets down on himself, yeah. and I hate when he, he talks down on himself or yeah. talks poorly about his body or his self and like all this, and it's like, you're so smart and yeah. you're so brilliant, you're so, so, like, it does bother me because I'm like, you don't see it. Yeah, you and like, see how amazing he is. Yeah, yeah, and there's times when like I'm feeling low about like say my job or my confidence levels, and it's like he does build me up. And then I'm like, okay, like yes, I have somebody on my team, and it's like mm-hmm. I, I get upset that he doesn't see that like I'm on his team, mm-hmm. rooting for him, yeah. like in there with him in the trenches. Yes. And yeah. it's feeling very hard. And like I don't want to not be in. I want to. I like I fell in love with this person. I didn't get married to get divorced. Yeah, I mean, listening to that, it kind of breaks your heart. Um, you um, and for me also, I think in a sense, it's, you know, we talked in the last episode about separate realities, but it's as if each personality has these two separate realities. So we listen to Matteo, um, you know, and, and 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 being very judgmental about the relationship on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there's this sort of beautiful level of sentiment that's coming from a coming from a vulnerability that we haven't you know that we haven't yet seen up until that point. And then um, and then you have Alicia, who's you know now just she's you know if you, it's in a sense I just want to match the, the personalities that come forward in that level of vulnerability and let them have a conversation if we could sort of magically, you know bring them together when they're in that space you'd think that everything would be resolved in one fell swoop but then they get back into their corner they get back into their judgment and uh, and that's where the difficulty lies but but the uh, but the love is obviously there yeah i was sorry i was having trouble following you for a second in terms of the uh, who who was matching with who but what i understand you saying is that if mateo could speak with alicia when they're both in this space of vulnerability, then that would be a really beautiful conversation. Yes, definitely. And that, unfortunately, what's been happening is that they haven't been meeting each other from that place, and they've been having conversations from the what you're calling the other personality, <laughs> um, from a from the other state of mind where they're more defended and angry and upset, and those conversations aren't going well. Yeah, and the defenses are up. His guard is up. Yes. And there's the odd, odd little jab here and there. Yeah. Well, choose my moment to, to do that. Absolutely. And then she has um, her guard up and the various explosions that happen between them. All of that 
is not coming from that place of open heartedness, that place of love that's really there for both of them. Yeah. And so next we're going to be looking more at the the common ground that they do have, even though they're having trouble seeing it for themselves. It's really clear that they have a lot in common and they're both suffering and they're both feeling quite lonely in the relationship. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? They're, they're both suffering. And uh, yeah, you can only imagine that you're right about that. They're, they're feeling lonely. Very, very intuitive of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, so let's listen to Alicia. Doesn't like to talk at all. Oh, like no. the communication is really bad. It's very surface level. And he doesn't want to get deeper. And I've tried to respect that, but at the same time, as a human, I'm like, that's abnormal. So he doesn't really share too much. Um, like I think that he is suffering from some sort of depression that he's not truly aware of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of it stems from like his childhood, where because he's used abandonment with me before. He said like I've abandoned him, and his dad abandoned him mm -hmm. then. Um, so I think it's a lot of that stuff, a lot of pressure that he puts on himself when it comes to finances, when it comes to life, when it comes to where you have to be. So with Alicia, she's really feeling the lack of communication with Mateo and missing being able to connect on a deeper level with him. And in her dismay about how things are unfolding, you can hear that she's trying to figure out what's behind all of that and starting to put her own story together based on what she knows. Yeah, it's kind of interesting from the point of view that she's already, you know, he's accusing her probably of being kind of a sped up individual. Um, and you can see how she's transferring her focus uh, from them being able to have some kind of level of verbal interaction to now it's a very much a, a sort of internal process for her where she's just getting really caught up in her her psychoanalysis of the situation, which I'm sure ultimately is going to be proven to be erroneous. But uh, what she, you know, that's kind of all she's left with. She's she's unable to communicate with him, so all she's left with is the invention that's uh, coming from her imagination. Right, she's putting dots together that may not go together. But what I think is in, important to note is that there's, when she's talking about this, she's, she's feeling her pain and suffering because of the lack of communication. But I feel like she's trying to understand him. And like you're saying, based on the lack of communication from him in her trying to understand him, she's making things up as she goes along, but she's ultimately sensing that there's more going on than meets the eye. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of beautiful in a sense that she's, she is seeing the psychological innocence, even though she, not, she, she probably isn't aware of those terms yet. Uh, that's what she's essentially doing in a very organic way. She's, she's looking towards his suffering, and um, that's pretty, it's pretty remarkable all things considered yeah i think i that's what i wanted to point out that even in her suffering she was able to see that he's suffering and that his behavior in in some way she's saying his behavior is a reflection of the fact that he's suffering yeah i mean that's a pretty astute observation yeah yeah and then in this segment with mateo he really is just very upfront about how he is withdrawn in his communication and that's sort of his coping strategy right now mm -hmm. let's see what's afoot with Mateo um, I uh, and I can tell you I mean you know my off-putting um, emotions with you know certain things has led to me being more distant in our relationship not being romantically involved and sometimes even just being mindfully absent or absent altogether because um, like you said I created this narrative and now when I just enter in my home. I, I don't feel that I can relax. I feel like I'm, I'm you know, in a straitjacket all the time. And um, and you're right. When I look at her now, it's kind of just like I don't have that. I have built up this narrative. And even if 
you know, nothing has occurred that day that would make me feel um, the way that I do with like the not resentment, but just the played out storyline. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I've done that, and I mean, she has every right to feel also lonely in the relationship because I know I haven't done what I would want to do. That's that's what irks me the most is. I want to surprise someone. I want to cuddle up with someone. I want to give them warmth and, and you know, the feeling. But it's just, I'm so pulled back from that at this moment that um, it even makes me feel sad that I can't have that emotion with anybody. Well, you, you look at this and you hear Matteo. And um, for me, I, 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 you know, I can see where Alicia is coming from in the sense that she's now got preoccupied with sort of trying to psychoanalyze this situation. And really, that's all she's left with in the sense that here is Matteo, who's putting up his barricades and has decided I'm going to extricate that. I, I'm going to extricate from my, myself from the situation. I can't do it physically. But I can do it emotionally and I can cut off all forms of communication on that level. And, um, and there's this sort of misguided notion that that's going to keep him somewhat protected when in actual fact that's actually taking up a lot of energy. There's a lot of bandwidth taken up with that very purpose that he's decided to take on board for himself. So here's, a, here's an individual who's decided to take that stance and then here is Alicia who's, who's kind of left with her imagination and is trying to figure out what, in the, what on earth is going on here in this man's mind. And, um, and that must take its toll too. Obviously it takes its toll and that's also taking up a lot of bandwidth. So here we have two individuals who are expending a great deal of energy well, you know, in, in a very unnecessary way. And so... For me also, when I consider this, is that we have worked with other couples who can really spend a good deal of their married life showing up in this way. And we would refer to that as an unhealthy normal. So let's hope we've, we're have we going to be able to nip this in the bud fairly early on, but you can see the beginnings of what is obviously going to look like a very unhealthy normal if they continue in this vein. And I think that's a really good point that you're making that it takes up a lot of energy to stay polarized. Because when couples are in conflict, they often don't realize how much energy is required to stay in the anger, to stay in the resentment, to stay in the upset, to fuel everything that's needed to maintain the polarization. And that it's actually easier to relax into your natural state and be kind and loving and warm and open-hearted with each other but it's oftentimes invisible to people. Just like you said with Matteo, he's thinking that his lack of communication is keeping him safe, that that's his coping mechanism, the way that he's trying to protect himself emotionally, but that takes a lot of energy and he's suffering. He even says, I want to cuddle. I'm not showing up the way that I want to show up. And that's painful for him. His coping mechanism is creating suffering for him, not just in terms of the ramifications in the relationship. And, you know, Alicia's outbursts, that's her best way that she can figure out to let off her steam. But ultimately, that's draining as well. That's not just draining on him, that's draining on her too. So, you know, it's clear that they are polarized but they're not seeing that it's actually much easier to not be polarized. Yeah, well, well said. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really have anything to add to that. That's just, you know, that's the situation that is. They've definitely polarized in no uncertain terms. And, um, and at some point, someone has to take the higher ground. In a sense, I feel like Alicia, you know, really has enabled herself to maneuver herself in that direction just by virtue of the fact that she, uh, she shared some of her concerns about where, he may, where she may be able to see her, his suffering. Yeah. So in terms of where we're at with them now, we've done some intake and we're learning more about what they're polarized on. And even at this point, we've, you know, you especially, Angus, did your best to point in the direction of where the love is, point in the direction of what is working. And, and the tendency for each of them is to focus on what's not working 
to focus on the negative. And of course, that's what they expect to do. That's what they've done in the other therapy that they've gone to. And so the, it feels normal to go to the long list, what you would call the laundry list, <laughs> the long list of things that um, they feel are wrong with the relationship and aren't working. And to use your metaphor, we're actually asking them to get familiar with what love looks like and to track the love or stalk the love, but to, to really see where the love is still in the relationship. And rather than focusing on what's not working, to help them to remember and see where the love is and to remember that they do love each other. Because even in the little snippets that we've shared, it's really clear that there are segments where it's obvious how much they care about each other. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I guess, you know, for us moving forward, we got to get Matteo to somehow realize that this, this stance of feeling like he needs to batten down the hatches and hunker down in his, his glorious position, or not so glorious position as the case may be, is, is a fool's errand that's just going to create more suffering. He's really kind of created this container for himself, which is just ultimately going to suffocate him at some point. And well, the good news is that they both do want love and intimacy. They both said that. They have both at times expressed compassion. Alicia's expressed compassion for Mateo feels like he's suffering. He's expressed compassion for her, recognizing that his behavior is hurtful. So they, they have that care for each other. It's just difficult for them to maintain in a day-to-day -day way. And really, it's going to be for both of them to take the higher ground, to both, for both of them to see what other possibilities are available to them in the relationship. And in the next sessions, what we're going to be looking at is helping them to see that the other person isn't responsible for their suffering. We're going to be looking at where their experience really comes from so that they can feel more empowered and less victimized in the relationship. We're going to be looking at how their experience of reality is subjective and it changes based on their mood and helping them to see when they can trust their thinking and when they can't trust their thinking. And so rather than working on fixing any of these relationship dynamics, what we're going to do is we're going to help them understand how their minds work. So with that understanding, they can connect more fully with their own innate health, their own innate well-being, their own innate resilience, and to feel the truth of who they are more fully. And from there, see how they perceive the relationship at that point. Well, at this point, I guess I should reevaluate this idea of using the metaphor of us being stalkers. Um, because I think if we're going to talk about getting them to the higher ground, probably the role that would be better suited to explaining what we have to do here is that we're more like Sherpas. And at this point, we've uh, probably got our Land Rover to the bottom of the mountain, and uh, they've got all their equipment out for us to see. <laughs> and uh, now we've got to figure out where to establish base camp and then plot our route to the summit. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. But at this point, I have to say, I'm a little bit uh, suspicious that uh, Matteo is going to struggle with this idea that Alicia is not the root cause of all his suffering. I think that that's going to be somewhat challenging, but we will see. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right, I don't know. But I can see how that's definitely going to be a very big part of this journey and uh, maybe uh, the greatest crevice for us to uh, negotiate our way across. We'll see what happens. Is it crevice or crevasse? Well, I think because you've spent time in France, you might be inclined to call it crevasse, which sounds very highbrow indeed, but I'm pretty sure where I come from, in Blighty, they would say crevice, which sounds, doesn't sound nearly so hoity toity I thought you were using a climbing reference. I was using a climbing reference. I guess we'll have to look that up too. Okay, and put it in the footnotes. Show notes. Oh, excuse me, the show notes. Maybe we'll have to look that up too. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much for listening to Rewilding Love. If you enjoyed this podcast, please let us know by subscribing on iTunes. And we would love for you to leave a review there. iTunes reviews will steer people to this podcast who need help with their relationships. If you would like to learn more about our work and our online rewilding community, please visit our website, therewilders.org. Thanks for listening. Join us next week. Thank you.